So, um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. There are 25 of us in the room, no doubt a few more will we'll, we'll turn up as the afternoon progresses or the early morning progresses. Um, yeah. Just a reminder of, of what this is all about, that the aim of the President Series is to, is to find interesting people, invite them into a shared space to talk about the things that they want to talk about, and then for the rest of us to try and distill, distill some, I was going to say common sense, but common threads would be a better, a better choice of word um, from the things that they, that they choose to, to share with us. So tonight's two speakers, um, Kerry, I'm never sure how to pronounce your say, is it Lunny? Kerry? It is Lunny and Brian Collins. Uh, uh, Kerry's, Kerry's got the, the, the joy and privilege of going first. So I will read what it says on my bit of paper um, to make sure I get it right. So what we'll do is Kerry will speak for a while um, and share some slides and then we'll take one or two questions at the end of that session. Um, when she's done that um, we will move on and we will hear from Brian and at the point where we have heard from both and asked Brian some difficult questions we will then um, try and synthesize a, a sort of joint understanding out of the whole. Um, we will finish at seven o'clock in English time um, because my dinner will be ready at that point, as I suspect will numerous others. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you all here. So let me tell you that Kerry is the Country Engineering Director and Chief Engineer in Talos, Australia. She's the President of the International Council on Systems Engineering and holds the Expert Systems Engineering Professional Qualification as well has extensive experience across large system solutions, developing and delivering, um, and has worked in ICT, gaming, financial, transport, aerospace, and defense in Australia, Asia, and USA. Pretty sure she can fill in the rest for herself. Kerry, we're very grateful to you for getting up at this, um, or staying up till this ungodly hour of the morning, whichever way around it is. The floor is yours. I will give you a warning at um, about five minutes before you're due to, to finish. And you can start anytime now. Thank you very much. Everybody else on mute, please. Sure. Uh, everyone can see the screen and hear me. Excellent. Okie dokie. Um, I'll just go through quite quickly to allow some Q&A time. Uh, I do apologize if I go into some acronyms, uh, but hopefully they will make sense at the end of the day. Uh, let's see now. Is that going to work? Okay, I want to just start with a picture of painting tomorrow's reality. So edge computing, obviously cloud computing, artificial intelligence at whatever three levels, if you think we'll get to singularity or not, uh, there'll be a lot more to do with quantum computing, quantum communications, uh, different architectures, predictive models that would be using singularity, smart nations, so on and so forth. So qu quite an exciting time. Um, and uh, you can see from just the photos there with the, with the, uh, the city itself or the buildings, uh, that's part of a smart nation where you bring your food chain to where the um, urban group is because uh, they predict about 70 to 80% of the world will be in the urban spaces in the next 20 odd years. Uh, you've got the robotics there, AI, everything is more interconnected, interoperable, makes it harder to do our jobs, more complex solutions, uh, more unintended consequences, and uh, non-determinism comes into play. So that's tomorrow's future, very exciting. It's going to be uh, great to be part of it. What does that mean for us? So before I just started, I just wanted to, to put up a, a few small definitions between cybernetics and systems engineering. No matter what we do to engineer a system, so creating a one is made up of these uh, six elements of people, products, services, information, processes, and natural elements, all in different degrees of um, complexity, shall we say, or uh, of usage. Cybernetics. I even reached out to John to find where can I get a good definition of cybernetics. I can't find one. I'm sorry. Um, there is lots of definitions, but not one that, that really stood out. So I put a few varieties up there, even went to the website um, uh, for the Cybernetics Society of the UK. And it was actually in a blurb in an advertisement for a, um, a um, program that had come and gone. Uh, so I thought I'll put that up there just to see what the differences are. And here's the systems engineering definition from the uh, ENCOSI definitions that updated only about a year ago of what it is to be uh, to do systems engineering. 
And the main thing there is to notice it's transdisciplinary and integrative. But if you look at that too, there's a lot of similarities here. That's why, uh, what I call the marriage between cybernetics and systems engineering, it, it's, it's a relationship that is already quite close um, and uh, can only grow together. So you're talking about transdisciplinary, study of systems, integrative and so forth. So just sort of setting that there. And then when people think of systems engineering, all these sorts of things pop up. And when I talk about systems engineering, I'm talking right from uh, the concept right through to retirement in a life cycle, a model based approach, a lot of representation um, from models, operational scenarios, mission threads, different architectures, uh, swim lane diagrams involving your specialties, which may be safety, security, uh, human systems integration, EMI, MC, so on and so forth. Uh, working on performances and interfaces. So we look at things holistically, we break it down into pieces, but don't forget the overall view, which is what we're there in the first place, and put the pieces back together to see if we've got a, a system that was intended that is of use. Of course, people also think of systems, you think of the different life cycles, waterfall, V-model, in incremental, evolutionary, spiral, agile, lean, product line engineering, and there's going to be some more going forward um, Boeing has come up with a, a with a, a life cycle model. Uh, we've come up one with Talus is different to help us with the non-determinism and the fast technology rate of changes. So there's diamond models and so on and so forth. So interesting. You can also think of different architectures and different architecture frameworks. And what I'm showing on the right hand side is uh, a uh, picture from the NATO architecture framework or NAF version four, where you look at things from different viewpoints. So you're looking at things from different perspectives. So you can look at the same design or the same architecture from a number of different perspectives and it challenges that. So you look at it from an ongoing service work, look at it from a logical design, look at it from a physical design, look at it from specialties, such as from a safety perspective, a human systems integration perspective, look at the data that it's generated. All of this is required if you move into the digital transformation, which has a lot of parallel with uh, systems work uh, along the lines of with data rules. And so you follow that uh, data thread and trusted source and uh, use that from the model. So the models are not necessarily king, it's the information and the different types of architecture frameworks help with that. So that's the world of systems. And if you break that up into what are the main elements, again, this is from Encozy, you've got the, um, oh, excuse me, number of elements there from the competency, from technical management, technical leadership, from soft systems. So don't forget the soft skills, um, communications, team collaboration, so on and so forth. Systems, systems of systems thinking. So from a systems approach, you also have some practices, processes, models, and methods um, to put a little bit of logic into the madness, but not to create, uh, not to, sorry, not to stop that creativity. It is only there to support. Um, I have often people say that it's very process oriented. That is not true. The most more process are involved in software engineering, in nuclear, etc. Uh, we have processes that make sense and throw them out if they don't and create new ones. Uh, domain knowledge and applications and the system sciences with our researchers, which is our fundamental theory behind it. But I will say that unlike other disciplines, often the science behind the engineering lags in systems engineering. The practicality often takes over and from a point of view of heuristics and principles, it's along the lines of this worked uh, let's think it's the analogy or similarity. Hopefully it will work or there's a pattern there. And then after we get the pattern, we sort of think, how did that work? Why did that continue to work or not work? And uh, so there's the system science. So sometimes we look a bit fluffy uh, compared to other disciplines uh, because we're not hardcore physics or based on uh, algorithms as such. We do have an element of that, obviously, but we do have the soft fuzzy stuff as well, which we spend up the front with our systems thinking. So all of this is required to achieve our system solutions. And of course, they're all required 
to enable your cybernetic solutions. So where are we now? Obviously, we're about 10 years into the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, it's been pretty exciting, about another 20 odd years to go. And these are examples of what's driving change today and tomorrow. Uh, and it's not meant to be uh, all inclusive. There's many more. I forgot edge computing on there. Uh, I, need, uh, I think I've got blockchain on there, robotics, etc. Internet of things, internet of everything, depending how you want to look at that. Uh, sensor networks, mesh networks, very exciting times. Genetic um, editing, um, cyber genetics, all of that is coming along. So uh, great for all of us. So if I look at that of addressing the challenges in our union, if I want to look at some systems approaches and practices and te techniques, there's a few of them up there in the blue funnel. Uh, our principles and heuristics, our systems thinking approach, our systems and systems interoperability, a model based approach, situational awareness, extremely important and more and more important if you're moving in the world of artificial intelligence and machine learning, which I've still yet to get a good answer on how do we do configuration management of those systems if they truly are self-learning? How do we actually work with a trusted environment uh, when you cannot verify and validate it while it keeps changing? I've got some ideas there, happy to talk about it, but there is no solid answer that I can find at the moment. And I know there's research into that area. Uh, consider the digital twin, what makes sense to actually create it? A lot more simulation, virtual reality, augmented reality. Resilience is gonna be very important. If you're using these types of techniques and practices and approaches, it's gonna help with all the cyber solution challenges and which are, uh, are quite um, difficult in times with emergent behavior. You need composable designs. You've got deployability, vulnerability problems information overload with all of the data, the sensor information, predictability, rate of change, uh, proactive maintenance, a little bit stronger than the, uh, the HUMS, the health and usage management systems now. Uh, you need to consider your supply chain optimization and so forth. Uh, there are often common problems with other, um, other disciplines. They're not just necessarily uh, unique to cybernetics, uh, but there will be some that will be uh, tougher than others. So I'll give you some examples now of how we can consider that. And I've put artificial intelligence and autonomy together because there are some common uh, challenges and guidance to address. So if we look at the effects of uh, having a uh, autonomous unmanned vehicle or autonomous unmanned system and AI, they can operate continuously they can improve productivity. It's uh, use them in environments where it's unsafe for the human, or it's a very tiring or taxing environment. Uh, a lot of information sharing, a lot of more process of data volume. I was reading the other day that they do believe there are some cures out there for particular types of cancer. If only we've got the um, AI behind to troll through the trillions of data that are out there. Uh, but nobody's put the links together. Don't know if that's true or not, uh, but that's an interesting concept. Uh, of course, it can only mean that there is progress there if we can work through that all. And then uh, obviously there's reduction in the use of people and platforms. And the challenges of that is uh, of anything that you've got connected, it's got a pulse, it can be hacked. So the cybersecurity uh, side is an up and coming business, both for the white hatters and the black hatters, Let's hope the White Hatters win. Um, and, uh, and I do believe that if I can marry that with um, aged care, you've got a job for life, but I haven't yet quite got the links there. Um, resilience, it's gotta be very resilient and robust. So how do you stand in the face of adversity, uh, particularly when you've got unintended consequences coming through? Got to obviously worry about hey, um, safety, human systems integration, trust, scalability, deployability, remoteness, how do you keep your digital twin uh, relevant without going broke, uh, looking at patterns in the architecture. So the sort of guidance you can think of is think of things holistically, react speedily. So look overall, but react fast. How do you do that? Consider an agile approach. So your agility, make your project smaller. 
have more feedback loops. Don't be afraid to make a mistake um, and move forward. Create, protect and exchange that data. Follow that digital thread, okay? Use that right at the beginning to understand your concepts, your needs, your requirements, challenge your models with the digital thread, use them in your verification validation. I can't emphasize enough situational awareness. It's not enough attention is paid to that at the moment. It's only gonna take more and more importance as we move into robotics, stronger autonomy, AI world. Consider patterns and anti-patterns. When you're actually not sure what's gonna happen, there's a good chance that if you look at uh, similarities that it may succeed or it may prove that it won't on a regular ma uh, manner for the anti-patterns, but it's gonna make more and more use of that knowledge-based library to do with patterns and anti-patterns. It's come mainly from the world of the software, but since most systems now are software intensive, it actually has some um, a bearing there. Obviously makes sense, as I said, of the data model, the digital twins, and, and thwart those attack vulnerabilities. So look at your boundary conditions. Look at where those interactions are and the interoperability. They're the back doors. They're the things that are going to make you uh, vulnerable. There's the thing that you need to be resilient and robust with. Provide uh, more training on the information skills. You're going to collect more information. You've got to sense the networks out. You've got, you've got mesh networks out there. Information overload. What are we going to do with it? It's actually going to create a lot more data fusion and correlation and visualization simulators to make sense of what we've got. Uh, then obviously focus on validation of pilot programs. I do believe that when we move more into the unintended consequences, you'll go through a series of verifications, um, do the validation. And then I expect that uh, with the regular occurrence, whether it's on a time basis or a major change, you will be revalidating quite regularly because the circumstances have changed. You may not go back to verification, but I do believe that validation, unlike most projects now are done once or twice with the customer and they accept. I see that being a regular recursive activity going forward. Um, I'm not sure how else to do it through a, a trust arrangement, uh, but that's just an idea to consider. Think of system resilience. Well, we've had some good examples and some bad examples, and they're up there on the screen. The Titanic was not one of our mem um, moments of glory, uh, very memorable. But look at the Sky Tree Tower in Tokyo. Absolutely a brilliant design. I mean, who wants to build a tower in Japan on the most uh, movement of tectonic plates around on the Pacific Ring of Fire, tsunamis, volcanoes, earthquakes? It's an exciting piece of land. Uh, they build a big tower. They've got shock absorbers in different levels. Uh, they've got suspension of different platforms along there. This thing can sway and move incredibly uh, without you knowing it. Uh, a great design. Uh, you can argue that the deep water horizon offshore, well, you won't argue that was not a resilient. That was a, another disaster. But then on the far right, that picture was only taken just over a month ago on Mars. Great, great photo, the Mars um, Perseverance, uh, just a, a brilliant, brilliant piece of gear. And it's, uh, it's uh, survived very well. It's out, out pacing out doing what everything was expected. So how do we consider resilience? Underneath here is just uh, two examples and they're very similar of different techniques because all about resilience is, is standing up and withstanding in the face of adversity. So we look at the Jackson and Ferris model, those four attributes there, robustness, adaptability, integrity, tolerance. Under each of those, I've identified some techniques that you can consider that are quite um, relevant for cybernetics. You know, from a robustness, look at absorption when it comes to in the face of adversity, physical redundancy, functional redundancy. If you're looking at integrity, think of co coherence, your holism, your interaction between your nodes. Of course, from tolerance side, if you're talking software, look at those interfaces. What do I have tight couplings versus loose coupling? What is repairable? What is my defense in depth mechanism? How far down do I want to go? Adaptability, human is in the loop, not in the loop. How much is in the loop? 
uh, look at your drift cor corrections. Uh, then if you look at the model on the right side by MITRE, it's a different approach, but it's looking at again, how do I face adversity? I avoid it, withstand it, recover. Sounds like risk approach, doesn't it? Uh, from the means objectives, understand, prepare, prevent, transform. But on the right hand side are a number of techniques. Those techniques are very similar across the models. So similar concept, different terminology, many techniques to master. And I do believe that resilience is going to be expected. The future is not going to say, I need something that's safe, secure, resilient. It's just going to be expected as part of our due diligence of producing a good solution. Uh, they may call out more details if you have to get things certified, but other than that, you're not going to get separate requirements to spell that out. Now, if I show some examples of our systems thinking, I like to use this diagram. This is the National Academy of Engineering's 14 grand challenges they put out in 2008, and they're still relevant now, 13 years later. Look at the make solar energy, make it economical. In 2008, only 1% of the world was using solar. Uh, it's pretty pathetic. We've gone up to just over 2% now in more than 10 years later. Um, so much to be done. But if I look at systems thinking, I can look at the synergies across some of these grand challenges. So you look at these interactions, they're not to be done and considered inter, um, independently. So if I look at reverse engineer the brain, not the same as the AI going forward, it's actually recreating the brain. I don't know if we'll ever be able to do that, um, but just think if we could, the, the, the insight that would give uh, to, our, uh, to our own our health, um, to the ability that we learn. Now already advanced personalized learning is happening. If it's, it's been accelerated through COVID, the style of education, how we give it, um, they're also saying that in the future, uh, that uh, the investment the individual will make in their uh, own education will be stronger. Uh, they won't be relying on the employers. You won't get it necessarily from the employers that you need. And uh, they're also considering that anybody's been born since about 2015, and this is based in Australia. So consider cult similar cultures that they're saying that uh, you will live average age to 104. You will be required to work to the age of 80. You will actually have um, uh, four major career changes. So they're saying you might start in medicine and then move into um, uh, mining and then you might move into retail and etc. Not just just movements and be expected to be retrenched or re um, from an organization or a job six times during that on an average. So very different from my parents where you joined a company and you work there for life, um, et cetera. And then, you know, it's sort of in between in, in, in our age area, um, but your children and your grandchildren is going to be quite different. So personalized learning, make greater use of virtual reality, health informatics. If they can only get the regulatories sorted out between different um, um, bodies and different equipment. At the moment, everything is pretty much based on a, on a machine or a particular process in the health systems. Um, so if they could just correlate a lot of that data, which is there and give you better information on your own health and preventative, but the means of regulating that is questionable at the moment and everyone is backing off and saying it's too hard at the moment. Think of also if another example, urban infrastructure. If I can actually restore and improve infra urban infrastructure, look at the areas that this has uh, interactions with. And I really love provide energy from fusion. If, uh, if we can manage to harness that and do that without causing <laughs> a, a major cat catastrophe, a byproduct of that is helium. And helium is a non-renewable resource. Uh, so we're wasting it when we blow it up in balloons and then have squeaky voices. Um, we need that in our um, medicine, in our MRIs, uh, in our rocket testing. Uh, there's so many different areas that we need helium for. And, you know, what a great byproduct. Uh, so lo lots of excitement if we can just 
get this balance out and focus and move forward in one area, then we can move forward in multiple at the same time if we look at it from a systems perspective. Another area to consider is interoperability. It's the manipulation of data um, with the systems of systems overarching set. So here's eight areas that I think are important for interoperability. Um, talking about resilience, which I have, human systems integration to repl replicate the human in the system or the human-like uh, responses. And we do need to get over some of the regulations where why do we want uh, machines to respond better when they're replicating human-like than what the human would? Um, uh, so we need to, to get that balance and that perception going better. Uh, connectedness, that's going to lead to more mesh meshes. And we've got so much more used to network arrangements versus mesh arrangements. Patterns and anti-patterns I've already talked about. Sensor rich will be um, very, very important. And it also can be very disruptive if we're not paying attention to that, to what sensor, what information we're reading and misinformation. Collective intelligence, um, very important. Get rid of some of our group thinks, our unconscious bias and, uh, and look from that. And also from a partic um, particular point of view, if it's sensor rich, a lot of the stuff we will do with robotics and autonomous systems will be based on collective intelligence. So a lot of the sensors will look at nature from a swarming perspective of how things work that way. And, and, and I know that we're already doing that in agriculture and in defense, at least in Australia and in an R&D perspective. Uh, and agriculture's part of life is from a point of view of our drones uh, looking in um, vast areas of the country where there aren't people from a point of view of weeds, pests, uh, railway lines, maintenance, those those sorts of things going to be focused on the data, data is going to be key. And then of course, what we believe today is our ethics and behavior. We've got to do that balance with, with uh, human and robotics and uh, some of those moral dilemmas of acceptance that we've, we've got to change and cultural um, differences and sets of beliefs. Okay, I just saw the warning. Um, of course, if you want to come on board, uh, I'll be happy to introduce you to the International Council on Systems Engineering. And just to let you know, some of our communities there, we've got over 50 odd working groups and we hold webinars, events, uh, community cafes every two weeks that anyone can come. And we're also working towards the future. Uh, just after this, I've got a meeting again with the future of systems engineering, which is a consortium of Incozy is just one of 16 organizations there, although I'd say we're taking the lead and we're looking to see how that's evolving in the future in some of the areas I've mentioned. We also have a Vision 2025 document, which is currently being updated to a Vision 2035. Again, it's a consortium putting that together. Um, and these all consider that uh, our Fuse group is realizing that vision that's in 2025 and 2035. All of those are feeding back into the working groups to progressing where we're going in the future. So you might want to get involved. Uh, we'd more than welcome you. And again, our main conference is completely virtual again this year, I'd sad to say, um, but it is in the middle of the year, July the 17th to the 22nd. On that note, that concludes the presentation. I do like throwing up these uh, comments. Uh, all these quotes. Uh, I tend to do that at the end of any presentation. I find different quotes. These two uh, individuals, although many centuries apart, are saying the same thing. Do or do not, there is no try. So uh, thank you. John, you're muted. Not anymore, I'm not. Thank you, Kerry. <laughs> do, you want to, do you want to take your, your slide so we can see lots and lots of happy, smiling faces? Um, I, I'm, I'm going to invite some questions in just a second. And there is one already queuing in the chat, which we're going to ask you. Um, but I was just taken by the whole concept of the fluffy systems engineer um, in, the, in, in the middle of your description. Um, and I'm just trying to imagine what that might look like, um, rather than what it might be like to, to, to deal with. Um, when you 
the things that you're describing sound like systems engineers characterize the world in terms of artifacts, of things, of products, of outputs, rather than in terms of organizations and systems and people. Is that is that horribly unfair? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You gave me the opening. You know, it, it's, it, it may have been just what I focused on in the in the, in in twenty minutes, but it, it's, it's it's this is why it's really hard to grasp and understand explain what it is about the world of systems because it can be so broad and then so deep in certain areas as well. Um, it can be at an enterprise level, it can be at an organization, it can be at a solution and delivering. We use the word systems in a very broad sense. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's yeah, so, so one of the tensions, and you, you, know, you asked me for a definition of cybernetics, and I sort of scratched my head for a while, read my own books, read other people's books, and eventually thought I'd better go with the Cybernetic Society sort of website definition. And, it, and it's, a, it's a really difficult space to sort of define where we are and are not are not working. Um, and, and on that, Margaret Heath, do you want to come in and ask your question that you put into chat? You're on mute. Yes, hello. Uh, I was just really concerned to not hear a single mention of our most severe existential threat, which is climate change and the loss of ecosystems factoring into any of your your conceptual frameworks and and that concerns me very very deeply because you're talking about unintended consequences well we can no longer claim that there is no risk sustainability climate change is all in there i may not have presented it today but as an example i'm talking at the smart climate conference in a in a couple of months time in australia etc uh, we look at this as we're part of a work in um, and present with the United Nations with the sustainable development goals of which there's 17. Uh, we work and have a working group on smart nations and smart cities, which also includes uh, elements of the ecosystem there, obviously. So no, it is not forgotten. It's very much part of that um, an unintended consequence. It, and it can cover anything and it could be um, climate change it could be a security problem it could be a safety problem it's just that you you weren't expecting it you plan for for it and to be robust and we always know and um from our um our actual our actual vision in Incozi is a better world through a systems approach um and that just encompasses that because we want want a better world <laughs> Brilliant. So it's not forgotten. <laughs> Can Thanks, we do Mary, better? Uh, Always. Ed, Always. Ed Thunder Winden, you want to come in with your question, please? Uh, yes, I was thinking the IT. It's it's the uh, I work in IT, so uh, I'm pretty familiar. And to be honest, um, it's not holistic at all. The whole world. So uh, my question to you is: Do you think that systems engineering is holistic, or should it be? I agree with you, it should be. But. <laughs> approach to systems definitely should be holistic from a systems thinking perspective to start. The issue is that what happens is then when people treat it as something complex or complicated, let's just start with complicated first. Uh, they like to break it down into something that you can tackle and understand. So break it down to pieces. What they forget to get sometimes is when they put the pieces together, did they actually want to get to achieve what they planned to do in the first place when they looked at it as a whole? Um, and uh, we get bogged down so much down into the, the piece elements and keep forgetting to come back up and saying, is it, is it, is it what we intended to do? Is it meeting the need? Is it, is it solving whatever it was meant to uh, deliver? Um, so from that perspective, uh, but more and more uh, people are doing systems thinking whether they realize it or not. Um, and in some cases it's forced upon and it's not just to do with uh, technical or engineering. Uh, policy makers are starting to think along, good policy makers are starting to think along those lines. Um, education system is starting to think along those lines um, from a point of view of a career path, etc. A little bit slower in those areas, but there, there's some examples. 
Uh, right. Brilliant. So um, there are two questions that sort of I'm going to funge together into one. So one's from David Dewhurst and the other from, from um, James Bryant. Uh, and and um, I think we'll go with yours, David. We'll take the... Um, David's question is, how do we best produce engineers who don't, do not get dysfunctionally captured ideologically, I can't even say it, ideologically, um, or whatever, by a dubious minority? How do we maintain the purity of the thinking, Kerry? <laughs> Um, I don't know, <laughs> because that's a loaded question. I mean, from, from that perspective, um, you're always going to have your champions and the best thing is to produce something that's got a good result that people can see, whatever that may be, that's tangible. Um, but I don't know. And then, and then sometimes it's good to have adversity there and, and to question um, the purity. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, David is our, is our resident radical. Do you want to add anything, David? Yeah, no, I have, as a social scientist who's worked with social scientists and engineers, I generally uh, respect more the thinking and action uh, of engineers. But uh, keeping tabs on a load of different things as a good engineer has to seems to be very intellectually challenging yes. not a lot of people uh do that and hey yeah it is politically um loaded what i said but we live in a political world i'm very aware from catastrophe theory systems are at their most efficient on the threshold of breakdown arguably that's way we're heading um <laughs> in all sorts of ways uh, yeah how do you how do you create enlightened engineers rather than social scientists who think they're enlightened but can't do anything? Thanks, David. Then, right, we better, then, sorry. We better, we better move the conversation on if that's okay, because our, our second speaker, um, who, uh, who apparently, according to the bit of paper I have in front of me, is a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering um, and a physicist by background, so he, he should work well for you, David. Um, Kerry, I'm hoping you're going to feel able to stay with us for the second half. Um, and I, I know it, it, it's very late, because um, what we're going to try and do at the end, a, a bit later, is, is synthesise these two things together and pick up some of the other questions that are there. Um, so Professor Brian Collins, it, it, Brian and I have worked together now for 12 years, I think it is Brian on and off. Um, CB, FRN, an honorary fellow of the Cybernetic Society, a physicist by background um, and a government scientist pretty much nearly all of your career, I think it's, it, it's fair to say, Brian. Um, the odd bit in excursion into the private sector for fun, I guess, as much as anything else. No money. Um, and now, um, are you emeritus professor now that you've officially yes. retired? Yes. Um, at University College London, and I love the ambassador at large for the UK UCRIC Research Collaboratorium, which was, I think, a neologism that you actually invented, Brian. Um, Brian's going to talk to us about insight, foresight and hindsight, a provocation on resilience. And I'm now going to shut up and let you get on with it. And I'll give you a five minute warning in 25 minutes time, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, John. And thank you for the invitation to talk. And I hope what I say stimulates a conversation um, this late hour, early hour, or very late hour for Kerry. Um, John just mentioned that we worked together actually for at least a dozen years. Um, initially, when I started to realize that um, a lot of the adverse, undesirable events that occurred, particularly in transport, where I was the chief scientific advisor, people said, and the, and the media said, how come they didn't know about that? And I'll let those words sink in for a moment because we saw it time and time and time again. And actually for the probably the last 10 years, I've been concentrating on who they might be. How did they not know about that? And when you start looking at that in any form of examination of public utilities in general, not just transport, you find that they, particularly in this country, and I think a number of countries that unfortunately have copied what we did, they've disintegrated single unitary authorities over entities like public utilities and pushed it out into the market, pushed it out in lots of diverse ways which means answering the question who they is, they are, they is, they, is extremely difficult. Um, and of course, to some extent, that was by design 
uh, and some of you will have heard me say this right at the beginning of the conversation before we really started, that was by design of politicians who didn't want to be stuck with smelly stuff if anything went wrong. Now that may sound cynical, but actually it's been copied all over the world because it looks like good politics. The last thing you want is some incident occurring that with the benefit of hindsight, you could say, well, that's a politician who should have known better. So they've made sure that it never is going to be a politician who knows better. At least they thought they had. Actually, they haven't. They've now lost the responsibility. They've lost the authority, but they're still accountable. And at the moment, of course, those in the UK who are listening to me will know we're struggling to find a mechanism for achieving accountability of what's been happening to us in the last 15 months or so. And I suspect other countries are going to do the same thing. So I started to examine then this word hindsight and indeed foresight, and I'll come to that in a moment. Hindsight actually is a made up word. Uh, it's sort of looking over your shoulder. Uh, and there's lots of phrases that are used with hindsight in it, like the benefit of hindsight and, and so on. But it does contain the word sight. And actually what you're talking about is memory. So is it a memory of what you saw very rarely? Actually, it's a memory of almost other forms of senses that we've got concatenated together to produce a view of what the past contained. And that memory is distributed in our body. I mean, you know, we have muscle memory. So there's certain things we actually remember how to do because our muscles were trained to do it. Um, and so the whole issue of hindsight, that phrase sight, is limiting in, 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 in the way we think about it. Not only is it not an individual thing, it actually is a collective thing, especially in an organization. So the, the corporate memory, the experiential memory, is a mixture of those things which are in people's heads, bodies, and in codified form in data records, information records that may be held in information systems. And of course, in the last 10 years, the latter has grown enormously. Uh, I mischievously said at one point that 99% of what the human race knows is on a spinning platter somewhere. The difficult trick is knowing where. Um, and of course, we're now developing all sorts of tools to find stuff because that is what we know. There's a certain Secretary of State for Defense in the United States who used a phrase, I think, just after 9 11 with regard to unknown unknowns. Mm -hmm. And what never really got examined was the unknown knowns. In other words, things we ought to know, things actually we do know, but we didn't know we knew them because we didn't have a mechanism for discovering them. So that issue of, of data, which is piled on top of previous stuff, because people talk about data as if everything I, I now get through sensing and sensors is new data, it isn't, it's piled on top of everything else that I've previously got. How do you do that? How do you do that synthesis with what you have, pr what your prior knowledge is, your prior information, your prior data? And indeed, how do you then look at the provenance of that? Provenance is a really important word in all of this. Kerry mentioned trust and trust in information comes from good mechanisms for achieving provenance. <coughs> Particularly important, of course, for social action activities, but it's particularly important for safety critical as well. So this idea of unknown knowns, I think, is a really important area for understanding what you actually know and how do you use what you know? Because if you don't know what you know, then you're condemned probably to mistake, make the mistakes of history, another phrase that's, that's fairly uh, commonly out there. The other thing we do with prior knowledge is assume that other people know it or other organisations know it, other individuals know it. And we never challenge those, or we don't routinely challenge those assumptions. So you find that uh, if you look at the stories, and John and I have been collecting stories of incidents in, in utilities for the last decade or so, that you find, oh, we assumed that they would know that that was really a bad idea for us. It wasn't a bad idea for them. So why would they do anything about it? Well, they didn't because it wasn't a bad idea for them. But as soon as we have something that goes wrong, then it's a bad idea for both of us because those interactive, interdependent, effects produce all sorts of multiplicative, multiplicative uh, consequences. So the idea that 
the assumptions that others have got knowledge is really an important element of collaborative working, a thing that Kerry also talked about. So that sort of system synergy is crucial when you start talking about knowledge sharing. What is also crucial is the context of the use in which prior knowledge, hindsight, could be exploited. Some of it people will refer to as common sense. That of course is an assumption that everyone has it. It's common. It may be available, doesn't mean to say they know it. And that's not the same thing of expertise because at the other end of the spectrum, it isn't knowledge that is commonly available. It's only known to very small numbers of people. And yet a lot of what we built and live on is actually dependent upon expertise. Relatively few people know how certain things that we are really dependent on. We carry mentioned nuclear power stations, but there are other things, uh, particular aspects of, of jet engines, I know for, for a fact, are very closely guarded secrets uh, in commercial organisations, and yet we depend on them critically for civil aviation, were that ever to come back. Um, Jonathan will know that it's bloody better, otherwise he's got a really difficult job as finance director of Rolls Royce. So the whole issue of, of, of assumptions about context of use and uh, whether it is used as situational awareness information and knowledge or whether it's used for specific purposes or whether it's used for highly targeted purposes is also important um, and I have a, a particular beef um, and if you've read some of my background you'll know that I did work in the intelligence community that reconnaissance is an area which people don't talk about very much. They talk about surveillance and they talk about targeting, but they don't talk about reconnaissance. Now, all of you, when you walk down the street, are always recon re reconnoitering what is going on around you. It is your situational awareness. You do it without even thinking. Of course, you know if you've got children, it's a thing you help children learn how to do, not to step off the edge of the pavement. They don't know intrinsically that's a really dangerous thing to do. You do. And your reconnaissance isn't only sight, your reconnaissance is also all the other senses you've got. So if you are used to working in, in urban environments, you know what certain vehicle noises are as they come up behind you. Of course, electric vehicles don't make that. And we've yet to learn how to program ourselves to, learn, to listen to tire swishing noise because you don't hear that. And that's the only noise that comes out of an electric vehicle typically, unless of course it has been modified to make a, no a noise, which is uh, part of what is being talked about. So this idea that situational awareness and hence the knowledge that is intrinsic to the situation you're in seems to be being neglected. As Kerry said it's a really important aspect of what we do in understanding how at an individual level and a collective level we achieve resilience because if you don't know that you're where you are in terms of the situation you're in then if surprises happen you've got no data on which to build whether of whatever sense, sense or artificial or human you are using in order to gather that sensory perception of what is around you, if that isn't being loaded with stuff, then you are in a difficult place. And those of us who have worked on military platforms will know that's one of the things you have to do, is you have to provide the person or, or the system that is looking after that platform with situational awareness information. So that context of use of prior knowledge as it builds is really important and how far back do you go how much prior knowledge do you include in everything you want to consider by the way in the way in which you make decisions about what's happening now i've mischievously said to a lot of people who keep on complaining the villages in the in the bottoms of valleys in yorkshire keep getting flooded and you say yeah well that's because water used to be a power source really i didn't know that because they hadn't read enough history to know why the village was built at the bottom of the valley in the first place. And that's worrying. Um, and that's a very recent piece of industrial history in this country. There's lots of other reasons why things are as they are for our uh, situation as we find ourselves in. And some of them are difficult to change. Where some of our cities are, a lot of our cities are on the coast because cities grew up as, 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 as mechanisms for global trading. I can't remember the exact fraction, but it's, it's, it's many tens of a percent. Uh, sorry, maybe yeah, tens of percent of people who live um, within 50 kilometers of the coast. And the worst case scenarios of ocean uh, uh, sea level rise are that billions of people are gonna be in difficulty 
by the end of this century if we don't do something about it. Are we going to take up, pick up a city and move it? There's only one country that I know of that's done that, and that's Indonesia. They're moving their capital away from the coast. Um, now, you know, if I said to Kerry, well, let's, it isn't the capital of the country, but let's move Sydney away from Sydney because you know, that is not going to be in a good place. You'd have five million people say, what? You've got to be joking. Um, and so the same would be true in London. Same would be true in Rotterdam um, because that sort of past history and the future, and I'll come to this in a moment, that foresight mixed with the hindsight is, is really part of the process that we need to think about when we're making decisions. So the learning of, of what has happened in the past, whether it's structured, tacit or explicit, is a really important part of what we need to do. And go back to David's point about social scientists and hard scientists. For me, sorry, I'm a polymath, as you've probably gathered by now, and I, I regret the fact I didn't learn enough about what you would call soft sciences when I was a kid, but that was the way schools were. Um, I'm not sure they're a whole lot better. So I spend more time now reading history, reading sociology, reading anthropology than I do reading hard science because I, it's that which is informing the human condition within the context of what we make and what we engineer and what we um, discover. So that learning process, I think, is critical. Really Quickly now to talk about foresight. The origins of foresight are very different. They're physical. They're the thing on the end of a gun barrel, which shows you what you're aiming at when you look down from, from what is not called the hindsight, uh, uh, backsight I think is what it's called, I'm not a gun person at all, um, and so that you aim at a particular target. So foresight does have origins in, in, in weaponry and it's all to do with what are plausible futures, on what time scale, what are the contextual assumptions that you might make about what might happen into the future. And it has a relationship to forecasting. Forecasting is, is a thing which we sort of say, oh well that is actually what's going to happen. And usually it's re re referred to in meteorology, in weather forecasting. And of course, living where we do, in one of the most difficult parts of, it, of the world to do weather forecasting, everyone says, well, why don't you know what's going to happen in, in three weeks' time? You're lucky if you know what's going to happen in three days' time. We've got better because we've thrown a lot more sensors at it, most of which are spaceborne now. Um, but we've also thrown uh, a lot more computer power at it. I'm told, by the way, that the lack of civil aviation has also caused our weather forecasting to degrade because pilots record and report a huge amount of information as they fly and if you look at the air, air movements over the last year it has diminished enormously and that local information is very difficult to get any other way so forecasting is, a, is another element of what we need to do and, and the expectation of the user is very important the user of the information that comes out of this foresight versus forecast because if the expectation is this is going to be precise and useful and I'll make decisions about it, then if it's foresighting, that's the wrong thing to do. If it's forecasting, then yes. But if it's foresighting, what you'll do is, is look at options which might or might not be viable within certain, certain um, futures. And the tools that you use, the analysis tools, and dare I say the synthesis tools, Kerry said that as well, how do you join things up? That's a really difficult area of, of, of academic work especially when you're talking about multidisciplinary synthesis. Um, and that is, that is it's really hard. It also depends upon trust, that you trust the analysis, you trust the data, you trust people to be saying things about the future, which is based on what they know about the past, and they haven't distorted that process. There's an old Soviet proverb, which is, the future is certain, you can rewrite the past. Now think about that. That was the Soviet Union. Are we seeing that right now in various parts of the world? I think we are. And that is being influenced by people who grew up in that era. So political statement. So that's the mixture of foresight and hindsight mixed together to produce outcomes for supporting decisions. Um, some of which will be engineering, some of which will be systems engineering, but some of them will be finance, some of them will be uh, to do with organizational structures. Some of them will, will be to do with politi politics. Um, so I think we have a, a situation, and these are my insights, four of them, where we have different people and organizations who have different temporal forward and backward bubbles within which they work. Some of them have long tails bubbles going backwards and long forwards. Others live totally in the present. And if you're working collaboratively with people, you need to understand what's the shape and size of their bubble. 
which is it collaborative with lots of other people? Is it collaborative forwards and backwards in time? And if you don't know what their assumptions are, that really does cause issues. Um, some value prior knowledge and some don't. And some see it as all that matters. And some see the present as all that matters. And I've said about some of our current politicians, they have no rear view mirror, uh, which allows them to say what they want to say today on the basis that it probably disagrees with what they said yesterday. Uh, but that doesn't matter because they're saying what is within their bubble of, of relevance. There's another phrase which we've got, which uh, one of my uh, colleagues in a previous organization I worked in used in the same sentence, which caused me to hesitate for a moment. We've always done it this way and history proves nothing. And to get those in the same sentence was quite a challenge, but he did. Um, and actually both of those things, of course, have validity. Um, but they are affected by other things over which we appear to find it quite difficult to have control and change. One of them is culture, where of course the change rates are relatively small. Uh, sorry, the, the rates are, are, are slow. And the other is legal. And that of course steeps into regulatory. So the legal and regulatory structures about history proves nothing or we've always done it this way is really quite interesting. Uh, and legal systems are different around the world. So some which are codified are very difficult to change and that gives you a very strong guidance as to what you can do. And others are case law like ours, and that allows you to adjust things according to the circumstance you find yourself in. Um, and we are, of course are witnessing um, manipulation of that through the neglect of prior knowledge and the neglect of provenance. Uh, and that I think is, is particularly important. So this retrieval of knowledge as, is an increasingly valuable thing to be able to do, both tacit and explicit, but it needs to be embedded in, in some sort of business process, some sort of organizational process, some sort of mind map of how the world could work going forward based on what it is we've experienced. But of course, what we're seeing is that that can be purposefully managed to produce effects which may or may not be what the majority want. So you do have to worry about how the oversight of this hindsight and foresight activity is being looked at. Where is the stewardship of hindsight and foresight when big decisions are being made? And what sense, because it isn't just sight, what sense is being used in, in informing that analysis? Is it a sense that we understand in terms of engineering and, and science and logic? Or is it actually to do with greed? Or is it to do with ego? Because if those senses, which most of us would recognize our senses, is dominating the decision making, then the past and the future are very different ones from what those who might be in the systems engineering, the hard end systems engineering world, would say is where their future ought to be. And what we're doing is, is living in a world which I love, and some of you will have heard, um, intertwingled. We're living in a world which is the mixture of intermingled and intertwined. Those things which are happening by accident and those things which are happening deliberately by design. And if the inter, if the inter designed, if the in, interdependence is designed in such a way as to produce perverse outcomes for the most of us, then we're in a very interesting place. So that's where I wanted to stop. Those are my insights really, that this mixture of hindsight looking backwards and, and looking forwards uh, is I think a very important part of what used to be called knowledge management. Uh, knowledge management was a phrase that's gone out of fashion to some extent, um, but I think it'll come back fairly soon because knowing what you know and knowing how to use it effectively is really what is what's gonna help us. And going to where is she, Margaret, who asked the question about climate change. And of course, that is a very important area of activity in this space because the deniers about the data and the deniers about the models are likely, if we're not careful, to have more media time because the story looks better. Unfortunately, the story of what we're trying to deal with is a really complex ecosystem, which includes us, of course, we are, we are the product of it, uh, is crucial. And somehow we've got to get hold of the media to be able to articulate the complexity of the story based on data and hindsight and models, but also predictions and foresight and forecasting uh, so that climate change itself, the effect of changes in the composition of the atmosphere to be more exact and the oceans uh, is much better understood 
and the consequences are much better understood and we mitigate and adapt as quickly as we can. So John, thank you again for the invitation. I hope that wasn't too uh, abstract, but. Uh, um, no, well, I've, I've written lots of notes down, Brian, as I always do when we, when we, when we talk and I try and make sense of them later, um, which is the sort of simplest thing to do in, in, in some respects. Um, I found myself thinking as we were talking about the, um, when you were talking about the, the hindsight and the foresight and, and, and the what senses we're using and the thinking about the skill of selecting what's important. Yeah. And, and how do we how do we even conceive of going about that? Well, the concept of importance is a personal one, isn't it? Um, it could be important in the concept or in the context of you as a person or you in the context of a organization. Um, organization sounds as if it's organized. Uh, a community with it, with, in which you want, in which you be believe you can add value. Um, and for me, if you're motivated to add value for the community, then you will adopt a certain way of balancing all these things. If, it's, if the outcome is personal, um, then you'll adopt a different set. And I think that's one of the tensions we have is those who are driven by sheer red-blooded capitalism or even worse, red-blooded ego, end up making decisions in a certain way. And that doesn't necessarily help the community. It may indirectly, it may or it may not. Um, and we see lots of evidence of that. Um, if on the other hand, you, if your motives and your um, ideas of, of success are to do with community having a better situation in which they live, then the metrics for that are quite different from what they currently are. And our corporate world is not designed to do that. Our corporate world is very much designed to look after the well-being of the, of, of the shareholders and the employees not necessarily in that order, but usually in that order. I think you're probably being generous in the use of the word designed there, Brian. Um, I, I, I'm not entirely convinced they're all that clever. Um, but um, Margaret, you, you've, got, you've come in with a lovely, a lovely question there, which I think is, is definitely one for Brian. Do you want to, to, to speak out? Yes, I was asking if you could say anything more about reasoning with probabilities versus thinking in terms of possibilities. Yeah, um, th th there's quite a lot of literature that came out of the foresight work that the UK government did. And I was involved with it with Sir John Beddington when he was the government chief scientific advisor. I was uh, effectively his deputy at one point uh, and helped him with the, with the old idea of how those uh, uh, foresight studies could be carried on and, and they've been going around for 20 years there, there actually is a lot of literature on that foresight website website the government go science website in in the uk on exactly that issue is um it, it's it's as much to do with the the how much can you say, say statistically in terms of, of probabilities how much can you say slightly in a slightly softer way uh, um which is plausibility um and so it, it's and then then you get to implausibles um i don't say impossible i mean being a physicist you'd expect me to say that everything is possible unless it unless if it unless it disobeys the laws of physics everything else may be implausible but it's possible so uh, and of course we're changing the laws of physics aren't we uh, but that's that's what physicists do so i think there is something to do with with um a whole area of, of statistical analysis which is based on prior knowledge and that of course is the other aspect of, of, of how statisticians use prior knowledge in order to limit the plausibility of first certain futures and that helps people say this is more probable or less probable based on the past but as someone's put up in a, in a question we live in a highly non-linear world so the future may not actually sorry the future may not be predicated on things that have happened in the past, unless you understand a systemic model of how it works. And a systemic model of how some of this socio-technical stuff works is almost impossible. So again, you're into not even, even prob probabilistic uh, because we just don't have the data sets that allow us to, to get over a big enough, um, um, what's the right word, sorry, um, uh, 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 
group of, 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 of um, inputs. Um, sorry, I've lost the right word, and, and I ought to know it. Uh, it's the it's fundamental word of statistical mechanics. Um, and um, <clears throat> I think that's part of the difficulty we're living in. And, and that is where a lot of the complexity research is going into at the moment, is, is trying to understand how you describe um, admixtures of, of activity where you don't have enough data, but you do have prior knowledge, which may not be statistical. Sorry, it wasn't a very clear answer, but I think there, there is work going on, but it's, this, you're absolutely right to point out that is reasoning in that area is difficult. A lot of people say, well, in which case we'll just make a decision. Um, uh, it's too difficult. We'll just do something. Bayesian belief net for us. That's one of them. Well, but it's, uh, it's, it wasn't the word I was looking for. Thank you for prompting no, my no. degree. But there, right. there you go. That's an example of, of bad retrieval. Uh, it's age as well as anything else. Um, ensemble. Ensemble is the word I was searching for. Uh, you don't just don't have ensembles which are rich and deep enough. So, so James Bryant, um, I can still see you're there, Bryant, uh, James, um, if you want to sort of turn your microphone on. You've raised this point, um, which you might want to explain about, um, I'm going to say, extrapolatability of knowledge. <laughs> Yeah, so my my my, my question. Hi, Brian. My, my my question was: Is that if you're making for if you're trying to forecast, then you're basing it usually on current experience plus historic knowledge, and since the world is changing increasingly rapidly, with more and more chaotic connections, so the wrens, butterflies, wings, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. The, the window and the ability for those kind of forecasts to be correct. I presume is shrinking extraordinarily rapidly. Um, depends what you mean by correct, uh, because well, you're, it's only when you get there you know when the, it's only when you get there you know whether they were correct or not. Um, so it does as it, it relates to the previous question. Actually, what you're what you're looking at in, in terms of, of decisions that might affect those futures is what options are likely of of your decision. You've got a set of decisions, and you've got to choose a subset of them <clears throat> um, what is the likelihood of a certain subset having certain consequences which are either desirable or undesirable um, and so the word correct uh, I think uh, and it's like the word definition it, it, these words are really difficult in, in when you're talk, talking about urgent, urgent, emergent properties of highly nonlinear interactive systems uh, they have a, def, a definitiveness which is not helpful well, what, what about you, useful then, as a, as a term, use, usefully valid? Um, yes, I mean, uh, they have greater utility, they may have greater resilience, they may be lower risk, but all of them are qualitative, they're, 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 they're not absolutes. Correct has a sort of absoluteness about it. Which... Sure, but my, my, my point really, Brian, is I, I could write an article today uh, to be published tomorrow, and the day after, some of the words I've used in it could be politically incorrect and I could be hauled over the coals. Yeah. Um, when, when I was making the right choices at the time, things are changing so quickly. Yes. That and that, that is one of the reasons why some people just disregard everything that's happened in the past. Because they say, whatever it is, it's irrelevant now. So I'm going to live in the minute. And, and th there is a culture out there, and, and I'm uh, listening to some of the students that we, we have in, in UCL, that is how they live. Because they, they, they can't be bothered to... to absorb all the stuff that has happened in the past because it as you rightly say things are happening so fast changing so fast that let's make the assumption it's irrelevant until you prove to me it's relevant and that is a different way around from how i was brought up which is and most of our teaching of our students is find out what everyone else has ever known in the subject before you start saying you're going to do something original say so, well it's bound to be original because the past is is now no longer having the impact it used to have because things were changing linearly and slowly um, discuss um you know and that it, it varies it varies from discipline to discipline from subject to subject some are changing really fast if you were in ai that's probably close to being true if you're in other domains of, of you know civil engineering you know concrete's concrete's concrete now that isn't true either but um things are happening the time constant and that is what i meant about and sorry if it wasn't clear that the bubble in which people live with regard to the forward and backward of knowledge relevance is is different in different domains and yet we're causing them to interact with each other 
So, you know, as Kerry said, if you want a, want a smart city, some people will say the smart city is going to evolve very fast because it's IT and, and data and, and behavior that will cause it to behave very quickly, change very quickly. And then people who say, yeah, but what about the buses and the roads and the sewers and the electricity supply, which makes human existence safe from a public health point of view? Those don't change that fast. So you're absolutely right. Uh, I'm afraid the complexity is when you write that article, qualify it by saying, you know, some of this will change in two days time and may be wrong. Some of it won't. Anyone who wants to criticize me in two days time, think about what it is they're criticizing and why and that might shut them up. Okay, um, so I've got one, um, Alan Lewis, I, I, we don't know each other. I, 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 I maybe should know you. Um, I can't see you at the moment. You just put a, a very sort of abstract comment in the, in, in the chat box, which is impact analysis, question mark. Would you, would you care to elaborate? I was just um, saying that um, I was just trying to put words into Brian's mouth as to what he was referring to um, when he missed a, when he when he was missing his retrieval situation. Yeah, uh, and, uh, but you're right. I mean that the, the that is a, 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 a crucial thing, and everyone says if I invest in this, what's going to be the impact? Uh, and the answer is probability again uh, yeah. we, uh, you're not going to be a make a definitive uh, statement about that um, and that is the subtlety of information um, manipulation it's what I was getting at in in without being over explicit uh, about um, the use of of prior information in a way which is partial manipulated manipulated or even full of untruths uh, if you don't understand how that might happen then your impact analysis will be uh, fallacious um, and it's it's tough stuff to be sure that what you're using in terms of prior knowledge or hindsight hasn't been tinkered with and, and you know how much reading do you have to do of every episode and you've only got to look at you know take the assassination of, of kennedy as an example we're now far enough away from <laughs> you look and look at how much was written about all the myths and, and possibilities of what was actually a, a very transformative event for the governance of the United States, because it impacted Vietnam, it impacted what went on in South Asia and everything that followed from it. If Kennedy had lived, what would have happened? In, you know, and and but you look at all the myths that came out and all all the um, misinformation, all the the, the uh, motives for people writing books, which weren't based on any credible evidence at all, um, and that's just the United States, which is relatively open. Yeah, I would look at, at you know, Russia. She. Truth? What do you mean? Okay, um, I'm going to move this on very <laughs> good. One, um, one, Robin Stowell, you've, you've, raised your, you've raised your hand, and so if you'd like to, to say what you want to say, and then I'm going to try and generate some sort of synthesis here, which will be entertaining. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, it, it just strokes a chord with me. Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, my, my profession is a, is a um, safety practitioner and yep. I deal primarily with, with risk management, so probabilities and severities. And the organisations I work with expect hard answers. Uh, and one of the few potentially sort of safety practitioner, practitioners who are in cybernetics, into viable system modelling, into systemic thinking, uh, my conclusion is that my profession is entirely flawed in its concepts and thinking um is that something which resonates with you uh yes it does um i i did when i was at csa and dft i did some work with um one of the big uh reinsurance companies and i don't know which one you work with but if you do um but one of them and we started doing some serious talking and this is 10 years ago about systems thinking uh about doing uh non-actuarial risk uh, assessments um, based on plausible scenarios, plausible futures, so that you could see a family of, of scenarios which may or may not be likely and, and then come out with uh, concepts of how risk would be managed um, rather than avoided um, in those various scenarios uh, in some level of detail. And, and, you know, there were hundreds of people working with that particular group of people, uh, that particular person on that issue because I mean 
you know, Suez Canal. I need only say that, really. And, you know, <laughs> that was entirely impl implausible or, or unlikely. And yet, well, I read today, I mean, you all know better than me, a billion dollars sounds a pretty hefty ticket for, for a navigational error. Um, so, you know, it, 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 I think there are some scenarios that people could start looking at, uh, which allow them on the basis of foresight, on the basis of systems thinking about how does this actually work? What changes are being made, particularly with regard to automation? I mean, it, it is really, for me, quite scary when I think of, of some of the ways in which huge seagoing vessels are moored in harbours. Is what are the error margins for you know, a massive vessel not being in the right place to within centimetric accuracy? Um, and how much automation can you apply to that when you've got so many other implausible, sorry, in, uh, uncontrollable uh, parameters around you, like swell and wind and, and someone looking the wrong way at a particular instant. So for me, scenarios which are socio-technical are really important in understanding how to do risk management. And I'm doing some work with the Royal Academy of Engineering in exactly that space, as is, as is Kerry. Um, and I think if we start doing the modeling in a way which is systems modeling and includes as best we can the socio sociological and the organizational and if, if necessary the political as well as the technical then we'll end up in a in a better place for understanding how to do risk management it won't go it won't be precise it won't be a bang bang answer but it'll get people into a better place of understanding how to do management of risk rather than avoidance or um, uh, uh, single precise answers to risk management. As an ex-Royal Naval Engineer Officer, <laughs> I, I understand the, the maritime connotations of this, uh, but yeah, I, 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 I'm immensely frustrated with my profession in, in the inadequacies and in understanding the complexity of what they're trying to do. And, and the, the majority of safety practitioners have just taken the, the very much reductionist approach and, yep. and risk management in its basic form is, is entirely inadequate. So actually one of the conversations I had was if you continue to do that you become a bigger risk than the risk you're trying to manage. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to, to I'm trying to do some often. new things. I have to stop you guys and, and, and yeah. try as I said, sort of a desperate you, for a synthesis of ideas here. Um, so so um, great thing about sharing an event like this is that you can you can you can decide for yourself what the rules are um and and so i've been sort of extracting from what kerry was saying extracting from what brian was saying and, and uh, some sort of extreme characterization might be that brian says um, it's all terribly difficult we um we don't know what we used to know we don't know what we know now and we don't know what we're going to need to know tomorrow um is, is a sort of a you know, reasonable description of, of where we might be on the other hand kerry has said look there are some tools and techniques out here that, that are designed to, to, to deliver solutions to problems that we've got, which the assumption that would, be, would underpin that would be that many of the things that Brian suggests might not be knowable are knowable at some level of, of consideration that actually enables us to take action in the world. So somewhere between those sort of two, you know, I can fix everything and, and I don't even know what I'm trying to fix. There's a, there's a, there's a sweet spot, maybe. But Kerry, any, any sort of reflections from well, you? Yeah, I don't want to give the impression that we can fix everything now. I mean, we have the goal, the target to be able to, um, and the toolkit is evolving. It's not static, you know, practices, processes, applications are evolving all the time. Some you'll keep, try and true. Um, others you'll throw out because they're of no use and others and, and new ones will come in and everything in the world of systems is tailored because there's always unique characteristics to the problem that you're trying to solve so you might start off with a basic set and then look at it and think mm, that's going to work that's not going to work it's going to get me so far I'm going to have to explore something else get different experts in, et cetera, because you don't have all the answers. You never intended to have all the answers, but you've got that ability to be specialized as a generalist and get the experts in when you need it, pull to the motley crew together um, to come up with a, a, a better solution than what you could do singularly. Um, just to, I wanted to answer a question earlier too, and I saw in the chats about systems, systems definitions, et cetera. I would say that if you're interested in Encozy, the, the systems definition 
that I used for the systems engineering definition was an 18 page document written by over 30 fellows that took two and a half years and wrote a 67 page report to get it down to an 18 page document of what it is to be a system and a systems engineering. And there's definitions there of the physical, the conceptual, the natural, the hybrid, um, the artificial, et cetera, and so on. So it's, it's a very broad <laughs> a look at it and happy, happy to share that. It's, it's a free, it's available, but you know, that's, if, if you've got a group of experts in systems that took so long to try and work out to defining it, um, there you go. That says it all. <laughs> I think it was Peter Checkland who said there are no experts in systems thinking. I think that's, I think that's. I, I would have to, I would say that that would be someone that says they are an expert. I'd say there's experience. <laughs> um, and, but, uh, you know, it's a hard call. You could be an expert, but you haven't stopped learning. You know, you, you know, again, you're building on it. Um, so can I chip in on this learning concept, mm -hmm. John? Because uh, I think one of the things we're seeing is, is, uh, organizations come together to, to deliver on large scale complex outcomes um, and then they disappear and disintegrate again. And so the idea that there is this idea, uh, uh, this concept of organizational learning is a dangerous one because there isn't an organization at the end. There's just lots of people who walk away with partial knowledge about the bit of the, the, it, the, it, the, the issue that they dealt with. Um, and we're seeing it um, People talk about HS2, but we're seeing it on all the mega projects that in infrastructure that have been run in this country. The, the people who actually know anything about anything keep on regrouping uh, around various things. But sooner or later, that knowledge that's in them is just going to dissipate because it isn't held in any codified way. It's held in their heads. Um, and in some areas, um, particularly in government, there is a, a structure of deliberate structural organized forgetfulness they actually for party political reasons make sure that nothing which is generated within a period of time that a party is running the country is available to the next um government and i've, I've witnessed it i mean i've lived it and i thought this is this is absolutely barking mad you know you spend a huge amount of public money generating knowledge for the good of the public and then because the party politics changes, you throw it, well, you don't throw it away, but some of it gets dissipated and a lot of it gets put in the National Archive in places where it's almost impossible to find unless you have prior knowledge of where to go and look, which of course I did in that particular instance. I know where to go and find the stuff that I helped create, but most people would never ever find it. And I think that is, that's heinous. I mean, that's almost criminal. Um, throwing away knowledge and organized knowledge is, is just not the right way to run a large organization like a country, like a nation, an intelligent nation, is it, John? So I think the, the issue for me, learning, Kerry, I absolutely agree, but learning by doing implies that there is a process by which learning is shared. And that sharing that learning when you don't have stable organizations, which for commercial reasons we tend not to have now, is tricky. Yeah. It's like doing the jump from being knowledgeable to being wise, from knowledge to wisdom. Yes, it's a maturity issue, which you know, we're faced with when we're trying to deal with these large complex issues of, of, uh, that are facing us in the future. Not least of which you know, is, is adaptation to climate change. I mean, mm -hmm. the good news, when you look actually at the sharing of the vaccine um, science and technology that's got us to where we've got to in a tenth of what it used to take, and people are now talking about another factor of 10 uh, for the next pandemic, that is absolutely transformative. Governments got out of the way of making sure that was possible. And governments you know, have to understand what they're good at and what they're absolutely appalling at. And, and well, governments, of course, are made up of, of the people we elect in democratic societies. So what we get is our fault. I would say mainly on that one, Brian, you get the odd one appointed, don't you? Um, Richard By, you've just asked a really interesting question in the, in, in the chat. Would you, would you care to ask it? publicly as it were you're on mute sorry just trying to find the right button uh yeah so the question just was can we use systems thinking to get better at aligning incentives 
Should we go to Kerry first with that one? And, and is that, did you get the question, um, Kerry? Just for what you do you mean by incentives as a, a reward or a, a, well, I'm, I'm not sure what you're meaning there first. Maybe, before maybe, maybe shared goals or so a lot of the problems that I see is people of uh, trying to do the right thing by their own rules and their own incentives. And if we can okay. align incentives, you can get better things done. Yeah. So in that case, you could, if you can show the synergies, if you can show the relationships, uh, it's like, you know, six degrees of separation, shall we say, um, if, if you can, is there some correlation between that? So then, then there's a common purpose or goal um, that would help if there's also showing a dependency. So for this to achieve, I need that to help, etc. cetera. Um, so systems thinking can help you. Um, show those um, interactions and interdependencies. So Richard, I've managed in time just to read where you are because um, he's on the board behind you. One of the things we tried to do was to get a better understanding in the transport department of what end, an end-to-end -end journey might look like. Mm -hmm. So getting suburban rail to talk to Transport for London, no, no way, no combined incentives there at all. And as you know, working as I imagine where you do in Liverpool Street, um, you know, that's a really tough issue. Um, yeah. But that's what the what what is then the mission or what was the uh, is it to is it to to make the ability to move people from A to B versus is to maximize my my own business that they, they they don't have a common incentive then. Absolutely. You know? Oh, and, and the DFTs was maximize the economic value of. The, the public sector investment. Uh, and Dr. after privatisation, of course, that was a different, different world. Dr. Dewhurst is showing off in the background there. He, he says there's some analogy to the Nash equilibrium required. For my benefit, at least, you better explain, David. Well, watch the film or read the book, um, A Beautiful Mind. You get this um, in economics, the conflict between competition and cooperation yeah. and if you want everybody to benefit well between me and the rodent in my kitchen that's not a scenario that I'm very interested in despite having done a lot of rat learning um, theory and what you've got to put everybody in a position which you can get theoretically in some economic situations where any slight change is going to sort of make a uh, things worse for people but you need an awful lot of information in that situation and I'm not sure that we're capable of creating a situation where people can identify uh, their own interests effectively it, 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 it takes too much processing so uh, some of us will always be able to game um, other people by persuading them that uh, our way of cooperation, which just happens to give more rewards to me, uh, is better than um, anything else around. Yep. I don't disagree. Everyone has a self-interest. <laughs> yep. so, so, so with the systems engineering, I mean, sort of the, 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 the um, the techniques and tools that you're talking about there, Kerry, I mean, you are working towards, I'll call it a solution for the purpose of the discussion, much more, more, more perhaps than, than anything else. So how does it deal with that alignment of interests when you know, you're building a, a nuclear plant or a, or a high speed tool or whatever it happens to be? Um, how, do, how does the systems engineering approach that? Uh, to understand the need in the first place and then you do a lot of stakeholder engagement. Um, when you talk to the stakeholders, all are important. Uh, when you go back to the drawing board behind the scenes, some are more important than others. And that's, the, that's just a fact to help prioritize uh, what it is uh, that you need to do. Um, and you challenge it because you'll get conflicting um, requests um, you'll get ones that are similar, which when you're producing something at the end that needs to get accepted and tangible, similar may not be good enough. You need to work out and, and find out what they really want. Um, and someone has to compromise at some stage, typically. Um, but all of that's got to be sorted out right at the beginning. 
Um, and then I would do typically some a lot of different types of scenarios and operational threads and that before I go any further to say, is, is this what you're thinking? Is this is what you're envisaging? Um, you know, you've talked of capability. I've got to take what you've said as a capability and turn that into something solid that engineers can create, design and deliver. Um, but it's got to match what your need is and, and the capability you asked for. So how, how does the exercise of power play out in that sort of situation? Whether it's expert power or political power or, or financial power? Depends upon your time scale, John. Um, you know, I think everyone knows, you know, we've just got one life. So the last thing we want is anything that happens to us, which is going to reduce the value of what we perceive to be mm -hmm. what we want over the next year, 10 years, whatever. Uh, and of course, we, we're living through that at the moment. It's why the you know, release of lockdown is causing huge social uh, disruption. Um, and yet the return on finance is, <coughs> is a market driven issue, a political, the, the, the return on political capital would better be within an electoral cycle. Um, we've invented this thing called patient financial capital. We haven't invented patient political capital yet. Um, and I think until we do, we're not going to get the benefit of, of, of patient financial capital. Um, and I think the, the story, the narrative of, of how in the short, medium and long term for individuals or, or communities and investment can be seen to have negative and positive consequences and have that story played back and allow it to be moderated by the, by the communities and the individuals in such a way that they see that they've been engaged in a conversation about what, what is going to happen or what's going to happen. Um, and this is where I, I run into my amateur anthropology. Um, and listen, reading around that subject, tribes that realize that actual breakdown of their tribal boundary in the form of conflict was the most expensive thing they could ever encounter. So they worked like fury to avoid that. They talked and talked and compromised and compromised to try and avoid that happening. Um, and we have sort of got a lot better at that in, in, in global communities um, and we don't go to war over it, um, but we still have local community tensions particularly in urban areas where this sort of, I'm, I'm never going to back down. I am not going to compromise on anything. Partly, of course, driven by history. And it's quite of, often driven by what has happened in the past when things have been done without due conversation. So that's another piece of hindsight. But actually, if you realize that people and communities have been alienated as a result of not being consulted, not being involved, then it's, uh, you're already starting from everything pointing in the wrong direction. You've got to turn that around before you have any form of conversation going forward. And that's a really tough, tough call. Um, so, uh, and I don't think we allow some of those processes uh, enough time and enough intellectual energy is put into them in order to help cause the situation where, as Cynthia Mitchell, my professor in UTS, ex-UTS, she's now an emeritus professor as well, says actually what you've got to try and do is get, make the situation better for everybody. Um, and what situation and what do they mean by better? That's a conversation. So if I can then connect that, um, uh, uh, Brian, to Chris Heal, uh, I, I know you're still, your, your microphone's off and your picture's gone, I assume you're still here. Um, and you say, I suspect we don't have to collaborate with everyone all of the time for it to be beneficial. Do you want to say a bit more about that? Yeah, uh, can do. I mean, I, it could get very depressing um, um, talking about how we all behave in such a suboptimal fashion, given how possible things could be with the knowledge we have in the world. Yeah. Um, but um, I mean, I have a bit more hope than that. And I, I, I see lots of kind of collaboration and community stuff where small things actually in time sh make big shifts. And you know, I, 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 that's what I mean by my comment about a collaborative mindset, even if it's applied quite locally, can can actually over time, you know, at least it would enrich, you know, your own life a bit more than uh, um, 
<coughs> than not doing it, I think. Chris, I think that's really important, not, not least of which, because the evidence of that being successful can be shared almost instantaneously everywhere around the planet. And I think one of those things that we don't do enough of is to share positive news stories. And the media has a lot to answer for in terms of wanting stories which are tending towards being negative rather than tending towards being positive. Can I go ahead and pick that up? So Mr. Rangel, um, since you're in the middle of my screen at the moment, um, so if we're connecting being collaborative with sustaining knowledge, which was you know, the, the how do we know what's important, how do we know what to keep and what to, what to throw away, and you brought in a thread about organisational learning, so uh, far away. Yeah, so um, my, where I'm coming at from is very much based on empirical experience within Rolls-Royce, um, but I've seen quite a lot of attempts at knowledge management um, so it, it lacks the if you like the political dysfunctionality of the kind of the wrecking <laughs> so, so so it's the right intent there um, but the only areas where I've seen it properly succeed is really where it's the sort of knowledge that you can actually pin on a process and is amenable to guidance um, or it's very technical yeah. like why did we design a part in a certain way um, but the more all-encompassing and, and the kind of softer stuff about how do you stop projects failing um, or how do you manage a certain supplier base, it, I haven't seen a knowledge management system succeed. So it, it is very much dependent upon individuals' personal experience or, or some kind of mentoring or passing direct person-to-person -person transfer that happens. I haven't actually seen a systematic. So just speculate. I'm not sure that's to do with the, the complexity and the number of variables and almost building that kind of subconscious knowledge of how to do stuff, um, or whether there's something else. So, so sustaining the soft skills and behaviours in the organisation and embedding the, the, if you like, the technical stuff in, in, in the process. Yeah. Uh, but the, but the behavioural dimension we might lose. Yes, yeah. And I was, I was going to do a, a, an elegant segue then to Professor John Oakland, but it seems to have left um, because you know, the, the thing that John's organization specializes you know, a, a quality consultancy and most of the work they're doing is about sustaining that sort of operational knowledge within the organization and, and, and ways of behaving. So instead, I'm going to go to Abdul, if he doesn't mind. Um, I, I can see your, because you've raised an interesting question about, um, or a, a thread about the African proverb. Do you want to talk a bit more about that? Well, it was um, something I was listening to an audio, um, a, um, a Blink book this afternoon, and it, it came up. Um, if you if you want to uh, if you want to uh, go fast, go alone, and if you if you want to go far, go together. Um, I've, I've done a an agile course recently um, because it's all so really popular, um, and and the points they're making really is around. I think you said, Kerry, about requirements earlier on. You know, the, the point of a requirement is really to tell a story um, um, and to share a story. So it's really about understanding and collaborating and sharing the story, um, less, less so about specifications because we, we, we live in that uncertain, to, uncertain world and, and that complexity and, and change are, are kind of the two certainties that we have. So it just talks to that point of um, collaboration, really, um, uh, and, and sharing and... and and um, maybe in a kind of systems engineering sense, that, that idea of starting with specification and then building out. Um, when we talk about cyber, you know, physical systems, um, may maybe um, there will be new ways of doing things in the future. Yeah, just on, on, on that side, the, the monolithic requirement specifications hopefully will go out the door yeah. in my lifetime. Um, they're still hanging around, especially the government type contracts. Uh, what you are seeing though, the more progressive, it's, a, it's they truly are staying at the capability level, skinnier documents, et cetera. Then we go into our trusted labs and we can model and do representation. And, and at the end of the day, if it works really well, and I've seen this in Lockheed Martin in the US in a, some of their contracts is they actually have a design and something working in the lab, then they go back and write the spec yeah. and they deliver it that. And, yeah. the, and, the, and the US Department of Defense is now starting to accept that on a few of their jobs. Um, now in saying that when they have a lab, it's a common lab. Um, so their subcontractor suppliers are all in there together uh, working on that. And you have a 
what they call a digital mindset or an agile approach uh, where you don't have fear of failure. You know, you learn from a mistake, move on, don't make the same mistake twice. Um, you get constant feedback and so on and so forth. So you have some, uh, so you have a, a model, a representation in some cases in a prototype before you go back and, and then fill in the gaps of, of what you want to write. And in doing that, they write less documents. There's no need to have a lot of the other descriptions along the way. They've got something. So they really have to document what they've got and then they move forward to, to make it more formal and, and verify it, produce it, that sort of thing. Um, how good are that's they the way to go. <clears throat> how good are they, uh, uh, should we say, sustaining a history that helps them to understand how they got to where they are? Do they bother? Uh, yeah, yeah, they do. They do still keep artifacts. Uh, it, when people are uh, often mistaken that agile means less paperwork, etc. No, it doesn't. In fact, you hold more reviews, um, but they're more targeted. They might be smaller. They're more meaningful. They're just not at this particular point in time. I have to have a review. Bollocks to that. Um, <laughs> there has to be a need. Um, but yeah, it, there's a lot of checks and balances in an agile approach because you've got so many moving parts. Um, so, but Ryan, it's, your, make, your... it's, it's a lean Sorry. approach, you know, don't, don't create waste. It's a pull mechanism. So, Brian, in your hindsight foresight world, can we overlay what Kerry's just said about that sort of agile process? Can we overlay the hind How would we overlay a hindsight foresight set of activities that looked at how something was progressing explored how we got to where we are not just so that this activity goes somewhere better but also that when we do another original activity we can use the learning so i think the for me the learning about how things were done successfully is stories that need to get told and as i said earlier the media is bloody good at telling stories about how things didn't work get told um i don't know anyone else read um failure is not an option book by gene krantz yeah. yeah. Now, Gene Crancy's book ha contains words, systems thinking, learning by doing. Most of the period he was talking about was 1960 to 1969. And those words were how they built the Apollo mission and got a man on the moon, three men on the moon. Yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a bloody good read for an engineer. It's also a very good read for a sociologist, because actually what it showed was how you build teams of people who have a mission and you know at least they had a mission and i've worked with mariana mazzucato as well so I, you know that has been reinvented um and it's been reinvented on a much more holistic way than the apollo missions were because they didn't quite have a blank check but they virtually did they basically you know money was not an option but failure wasn't an option either um and they learned how to learn and change what they were doing as a result of doing it in a way that would make your toes curl now, um, and especially going back to risk management, gee, you know, if you look at the last 18 months of them, they cut corners, they cut two missions out, uh, they bundled tasks together in the last two prior to the landing on the moon, um, which was very risky. But they did a lot of systems modeling with very primitive computing by modern standards. Um, and he was the team leader, basically, but it was team leader and learning by doing um it's it's a seriously good read i commend it to you all it's a bit Isn't dry it? in places but you know it, it's in that sense it was system it, they were inventing systems engineering to some extent while they were doing it and they were inventing all sorts of things um it was it was a wicked problem bigger than most people would ever encounter um and i think for me that that so going back to your point john i think we need to find ways of telling the good stories and getting them broadcast and getting them into our educational systems so that people know how to do things well and know how to be motivated to do them well rather than know how to do things and avoid taking risks because we are we have got ourselves into a risk averse situation uh, over a lot of what we try to do and as you and i have talked about you know i'm not that person um because the fortunately for me the roles i've had were take risks i'm you know it is a matter of public knowledge i was asked to be the chief scientist and director of technology at gchq at the end of the cold war now those of you who know what gchq is about will know it had been doing what it was doing from 1945 to 1990 and i joined there in 1987 when we knew you know things were going to change 
Uh, but we didn't know quite know what they were going to change into. All we knew was the Soviet Union wouldn't be the Soviet Union. Um, so, um, yeah, so that was the job. So not taking risks was not an option. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it is 18.52, so we're getting close to the end. Um, the book was called Not an Option. Uh, a Failure is Not an Option. Who's the author, Brian? Gene Krantz. It's Eugene, Jean but it's Gene Krantz. K-R-A-N-Z. Okay, so I think you've got there's that now. Another book that, there's another book that complements that is um, Harrison, Storm, Harrison Storm and his Stormtroopers written by him. Now, he was the project manager that won the bid for the Apollo against the company, by the way. They didn't even know what they were bidding for it. He held back the invoices and he worked out there was a six month or three, three to six month cycle before the bills hit the company um, while they were chasing it. Uh, he was the project <laughs> manager all the way through until he was the sacrificial lamb that him and, the, and his counterpart in NASA for when the astronauts um, died on the um, in the training with the with the fire in the capsule, um, but he tells the story from his view all the way through to when it, the uh, Apollo to the man on the moon, and, and that's interesting reading too. Very good. Um, and Brian, um, you're right. Money was no object. Um, no, it's there. They wanted a guy who was doing his PhD. He reckoned he had 18 months to go. They asked him what he needed. Uh, he told them. They gave them all the resources and he finished it in under X number of weeks yep. because he, he'd done all the research. He needed people to help him put it together. Things like that, you know, brilliant. So, so just to, John, if I may, um, I, um, the Apollo, oh, sorry, the uh, 2012 Olympics, most people realized was one of the best things in the UK that we achieved. It was ready six months early. It, it came in, they knew when the budget was and they knew when it had to be finished. Um, so, and I've said to them, so where's the story? Where is that write up? And they said, oh no, all the people who knew anything about it have all disintegrated, not disintegrated, they've all gone off and done other things. They're doing Thames mm -hmm. Crossrail, Thames Tideway, HS2, they've all gone. That, that corporate knowledge to write the book had gone. And that I think is a, is a travesty. That really shouldn't happen. And Abdul, there is another book called Digital Apollo, which I don't know whether you've come across, which exactly is what you're talking about, is the, is the nuts and bolts of, mm -hmm. of, of a digital twin um, in 1966, 67, 68 on very primitive digital equipment computers. It was stunning what they did. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, um, I need to call this to a halt. Um, can I first of all say thank you to Kerry and Brian um, for um, hugely different but equally you know, synthesizable um, <laughs> contributions. And I have to tell you all, they didn't know what each other was saying until they got in the room. So. Um, this is always you know, great fun from my point of view to, to, to see that the, the, the threads are there. And, and thank you, Tig and Kerry, for staying up all night for us. Um, it's been thoroughly enjoyable. Now, next month, and, and I have to declare an interest here. Um, so, um, a month away on the, on the uh, whatever it's going to be, um, May next month, May the 10th, uh, we have two speakers. Um, then one is talking about cybernetics in the Church of England. And um, so that's Keith Elbert, who's been studying. Um, the way that the church works and then asking the question whether the church is an organization. Um, and, and we have a second speaker talking about cybernetics and organizational development. And I have to put my hand up here and say, I have asked people to come and speak at these events. And they said, yeah, what, what's the application process? And the answer is, tell me you're interested. So my son, Matthew, who's sort of sitting on the screen with us all tonight, uh, Matthew put his, his, his best foot forward and said, yeah, I'd like to do one as well. So no nepotism involved. He just volunteered like anybody else. Um, and, and so he's in. So Matt's talking about cybernetics and organizational development um, from, from his professional experience um, next month. So I'm very much hoping all of you and others will come and join us again. Um, there'll be, the recording of this will be made available as soon as I can get it processed, which is in the next 24, 48 hours. And we'll let you know it's out there. Thank you all very much for coming and we'll see you again next month. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you, John. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks Cheers. Everybody. Goodbye.